Welcome to the Zoology Podcast. Have you ever wondered what would happen to society if you took away all outside threats? Took away the challenges involved in acquiring food and water? What would happen if you found yourself born into a safe, resource-abundant utopia? Well, it may not turn out as great as you might expect. Concerns over human population growth have always been a pressing issue because we live in a sealed environment called the Earth. The Earth, or its more local geography, can only support so many humans. This is known as a carrying capacity. But by the mid-20th century, there was a real growing concern that unchecked human population growth could lead to a societal collapse through a population crash. To put this fear into perspective, by the 1700s there was an estimated 600 million humans on planet Earth. Then by the 1800s, there were 1 billion humans. This then rose to 2 billion by 1928. Yet today, the year being 2022, the world's human population is pushing around 8 billion people. That's one hell of an increase in human population in such a short amount of time. But yet we haven't seen the predicted human population crash, and that's mostly because of advances in agricultural technology, leading to more efficient farming, greater utility of available arable land, and fertilisers being key in making annual crop yields reliable. So what will happen then if we continue to support an ever-growing population? Well, in the 1970s, American ethologist Dr. John B. Calhoun set to find out, and in doing so, shone a terrifying light into man's potential future. Dr. Calhoun set up an experiment which would be known as Universe 25, or perhaps more famously as the Mouse Utopia. This utopia was designed to eliminate many of the causes of population mortality that exist in the wild these being labelled as emigration, inclement weather, disease and predation. Dr Calhoun built a square open-top enclosure which provided 2.7 metres of squared living space. There was an open centre surrounded by four pens attached to the walls, which housed 256 living compartments and 16 burrows, which led to an endless supply of food and water, able to cater up to 25 mice at one time. All of these constructural aspects were equitably spaced around the enclosure, and the mice were restricted from climbing out of the top of the enclosure by galvanised metal walls, which extended 43 centimetres, or 17 inches, into the enclosure. This enclosure means that, unlike in the wild, the population could not drop due to emigration. Dr Calhoun dealt with the environmental mortality factors by simply controlling the weather. He kept the temperature in the enclosure around a constant 20 Celsius, at 68 Fahrenheit, the perfect temperature for a cosy mouse home, so environmental deaths were kept to a minimum. Now disease was controlled through two methods. The first was selecting mice for their health from the National Institute of Health Breeding Colony. This made sure that any introduced mice would also not introduce deleterious bacteria and parasites into the colony. The second method was the routine removal of bedding, excrement and any corpses at four to eight week intervals. The final mortality aspect, predation, was really easy to control. Dr Calhoun simply didn't introduce any predators into the experiment. So, the mice were going to be placed into a disease-free environment with plenty of room and comforts, no predators at all, and with an unlimited amount of food and water. If that doesn't sound like a mouse utopia to me, I don't know what does. Dr Calhoun started the experiment with eight healthy founder mice, which were set loose into the enclosure to begin their new society. This phase was labelled as phase A. Now the experiment began as you would expect. The mice explored their new home, found food and water, and underwent, in the words of Dr Calhoun, social turmoil. Then, once the mice had settled in, they began doing what most mammals do when they feel safe and secure. A whole lot of mating. And I mean a whole lot. The first phase ended on day 104 of the experiment. This was when the first mouse litters were born. Then the next phase began, phase B, the rapid growth phase. After about every 55 days, the population of Universe 25 doubled, going from 20 individuals after the first births to 620 mice by day 315. Now a couple of interesting things occurred. The mice, despite having an abundance of space, chose to congregate together in the western section of the enclosure instead of equitably spreading out. This resulted in some compartments housing many mice and others rarely seeing a mouse at all. It is thought that the social needs of the mice, especially when feeding, might have outweighed their need for privacy. 
this phenomenon extended into the places in which the pups were birthed. 14 broods were formed, yet the amount of difference between the pups born is fascinating. Brood 1 produced 111 young pups, while brood 14 only produced 13 young. Each of the brood groups had associated with it a male, which was territorially dominant within its area on the floor, with each territory overlapping only near the centre of Universe 25. The more dominant a male was ranked, the more young the male would produce. Now isn't that fascinating? It goes to show that even when you make everything in the environment equal, even when there are no predators, even when resource procurement isn't a factor, females will still choose to mate with a dominant male over a less dominant male. But this results in only a few males, in our case 14, monopolising most of the reproductive females and fathering all the offspring. By the end of phase B, the 14 social groups totaled 150 adults and 470 immature mice, which had experienced good maternal care and early socialisation. On average, each group contained more than 10 individuals, including a territorial male, other friendly males, breeding females, and their offspring. At the end of phase B, there were over three times as many young mice than socially established older mice. Dr. Calhoun noted that this number is far greater than would have existed in the wild, where their normal ecological mortality factors functioned. Beginning on day 315, Universe 25 entered Phase C, or the Stagnation Phase. After the population hit 620 weaned mice, the rate of population growth suddenly decreased to only doubling approximately every 145 days. It was also during this phase that it was recorded that the unusually large number of younger males who could not challenge the dominant male for access to the females started to become withdrawn. Dr. Calhoun stated that, in the normal course of events in a natural ecological setting, somewhat more young survive to maturity than are necessary to replace their dying or senescent established associates. The excess that finds no social niches emigrate. However, in my experimental universe, there was no opportunity for emigration, as an unusually large number of young gained adulthood they had to remain. End of quote. So it seems that when male mice cannot gain a social role, have no chance of reproducing, and cannot emigrate to somewhere else, they instead become both physically and psychologically withdrawn. They seem to check out of the game, and in Universe 25 they simply gathered in large pools near the centre of the enclosure's floor. This allowed them to avoid any attacks by territorial males, but instead resulted in fights amongst themselves, where sadly because they couldn't flee, many simply laid down and let the attacks happen in what looks like to be a form of learned helplessness. These attacks sometimes even turned cannibalistic. The female counterparts of these males, instead of withdrawing to the enclosure's centre, escaped into the higher level boxes, which were less preferred by females with litters. The males and females that withdrew into these higher boxes were not violent unlike the males in the enclosure's centre. Instead, they spent their days preening themselves and shunning mating opportunities. This behaviour got them dubbed as the beautiful ones. Even the dominant male's behaviour shifted. As more offspring were produced, the dominant males had to run more and more of the competing younger males off. This resulted in territorial declines as the defending males came under increasing pressure. This increased the number of aggressive occurrences in each territorial male, to such an extent that they would just roam around and indiscriminately attack and rape other mice, regardless of the mouse's sex. And without an attentive territorial male, females were then also more exposed to their nests being raided. Therefore, the normally docile females became far more aggressive, essentially taking over the role of the territorial male. Now unfortunately, this aggression spilt over onto their own pups, many of which were attacked, wounded and forced to leave the nest several days before they normally would. Females even started to conceive less. They reabsorbed fetuses more and their maternal behaviours became disrupted to such an extent that they would attack the newborn pups or just abandon some of them halfway through transporting them from one nest to another. This resulted in pups born in phase C starting independent life without having developed adequate effective bonds and the social skills they need to survive. These factors combined is what is known as a behavioural sink, and non-surprisingly this reduces conception, increases fetal mortality, and increases pre-weaning mortality, 
thereby accounting for the abrupt decline in the rate of population growth seen in Phase C. Universe 25 peaked at a population of around 2,200 mice, which is just short of the actual 3,000 mouse carrying capacity of the enclosure. The growth of Universe 25's population then abruptly stopped on day 560, which marked the start of Phase D, the death phase. The last recorded birth was on day 600, with pregnancies rapidly declining after this point, and no further young surviving. Dr Calhoun calculated that the colony would no longer be able to reproduce after day 700, and that the last surviving member of Universe 25, a male, would be dead by day 1780. A colleague of Dr Calhoun even took some of the beautiful ones and placed them into a new enclosure to see if they would be able to produce a new colony, but unfortunately the damage had been done, and these mice no longer had the capacity to reproduce, even in a new, low-density environment. And so that's the horrific story of Universe 25, the mouse utopia. But what has it taught us? Well, Dr Calhoun concluded that, for an animal so simple as a mouse, the most complex behaviours involve the interrelated set of courtship, maternal care and territorial defence, and hierarchical intragroup and intergroup social organisation, and that when behaviours related to these functions fail to mature, there is no development of social organisation and no reproduction. As in the case of my study, all members of the population will age and eventually die. The species will die out. End of quote. Dr Calhoun thought that this sequence of events, the behavioural sync experienced by the mice of Universe 25, could be applied to human society and feared a day when all human needs were met. Dr Calhoun stated that, For an animal so complex as man, there is no logical reason why a comparable sequence of events could not also lead to species extinction, if opportunities for role fulfilment fall far short of the demand by those capable of fulfilling roles, and having expectancies to do so, only violence and disruption of the social organisation can follow. End of quote. So, do you think that this type of behavioural sync could happen to human society? I personally think that humans have evolved in a condition of challenge and struggle and that if we don't have this in our lives to a manageable degree, then we cannot grow as a person, and our lives cannot be fulfilling. However, that's just my own thoughts. But I think we can all agree that, just as its name suggests, a utopia really cannot be found anywhere, not even in Universe 25. <laughs>